First, uh, I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to give a talk here. And this work has been done in collaboration with uh, Yaroslav Cholkovnyak. And this figure is, uh, uh, figure, figure is from micromagnetic simulations. Uh, so here I'm, I am injecting spin current here only at the boundary, of only at the, uh, through the left boundary. And that spin current is transported by this uh, spiraling spin texture, uh, which, uh, which we, we can call like spin super current. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the theory which explains this uh, result. Uh, so the question, the central question is this, how can you achieve an efficient spin transport? So it's a spin, uh, spin transport. That's, so uh, the approach that I take here is that, uh, because there, is, there are well-known uh, electronic phenomena in charge-based systems with zero resistance or charge-based or mass-based mass transport, superconductivity, quantum mole effect. By making spin analog of this uh, charge-based, charge or mass-based uh, transport uh, phenomena, uh, we can, maybe we can achieve efficient spin transport. Maybe we can propose uh, several ways to uh, achieve efficient spin transport. So that's the approach that I take here. So uh, this first, uh, first uh, figure, th this figure is about is the uh, liquid helium-4. So it's, it's visualizing this uh, helium-4 uh, spin, uh, uh, helium-4 super, super fluid. And by making an analogy, spin analogy of it, uh, so several people have uh, uh, proposed this super fluid spin transport, including So and Cecilia. And there's another approach. Uh, by making uh, magnetic analog of this integer quantum mole effect, we can, uh, we can uh, achieve this efficient spin transport along the boundary of these uh, magnetic uh, samples. So for many people uh, have worked on it, including Cookie, who gave a talk yesterday. So today I focus on this uh, spin superfluidity. So this is an outline of my talk. So uh, because this spin superfluidity uh, uh, is rooted in this uh, analogy of spin system to uh, mass superfluidity. So I bri I'll briefly explain this, uh, the concept of mass superfluidity. And I'll go to, I, I'll describe spin superfluid in easy plane magnets. And then uh, I'll go to uh, my, my work, my recent work about spin superfluid in a magnetic domain in easy axis magnet. And then this uh, phase slip, uh, because superfluid has this kind of uh, a phenomena called phase slips, which is, uh, through which uh, superfluid dissipates energy. So uh, it turns out that these phase slips in uh, of this spin superfluid in a domain uh, create coming. So I'll describe that process, and then uh, last I'll discuss this superfluid induced emergent ma emergent magnetic field on magnets. Okay, this is, uh, this. Uh, mass superfluidity has, uh, uh, was observed in 90, 1938 by uh, Capiccia. So this uh, liquid helium-4 uh, goes to this uh, superfluid phase when the temperature is below 2 Kelvin. So it, superfluid means zero resistance. It, it, it feels no resistance to flow in a liquid. And then the theory for it is this uh, was, uh, was, was found by this Landau shortly after it. <coughs> This uh, phenomena can be explained by with this uh, macroscopic quantum wave function. So this psi is a wave a quantum wave function. This n is the density of uh, this uh, sp uh, superfluid component, and this phi is the uh, spontaneously broken this uh, phase. So this uh, zero resi resistance of this superfluid can be explained with this simple Hamiltonian. So this first part is uh, so n is dense uh, non-equilibrium uh, number density. And C is the density susceptibility. So here, it, this, is, this is suppressing this uh, non-equilibrium uh, non mass density. And then this second term uh, is the, is the uh, is just suppressing this special variation of phase. So in the ground state, uh, superfluid wanna have, wants, wants to have this uniform phase. But it can, uh, uh, there's an energy cost with, uh, associated with the special oh. variation, and A represents the stiffness of that order parameter. So this, uh, there are two important quantities here. 
n number density and this five, five phase. And uh, uh, an inter uh, mo most important property with of these uh, fields uh, they, they they satisfy this conjugate relation. So they are canonically conjugate variables. So they satisfy this kind of uh, commutation relation. And then this so also also importantly this Hamiltonian has a U1 symmetry. So it's invariant under this global phase shift. So, and then according to this uh, Nether's theorem, there is this conjugate quantity associated with this uh, invariance of Hamiltonian. That's nothing but this uh, total number of the system. So uh, let's, let's keep in mind this kind of a structure. We have this Hamiltonian, which is invariant under this U1 transformation. And we have two uh, canonically conjugated variables, density and phase. And from this Hamiltonian and commutation relation, we can derive this two coupled Hamilton equation motion. The first, e first equation is phi dot is equal to this density divided by this uh, susceptibility. So it's, it's a Josephson relation. It's, just, uh, it's Josephson relation. Uh, for example, if, if we consider charge superconductivity instead of a mass superfluidity, this N is the uh, charge accumulation and C is the uh, capacitance. So N over C is basically voltage uh, applied to this superconductor. So this is nothing but phi equal to phi dot is equal to V, which is Josephson relation. And the second, second equation about this time evolution of density, so N dot is equal to this Laplace of phi, it can be uh, written as this, as a continuity equation. Here J is, uh, J is mass supercurrent, which is proportional to the gradient of a phase. So this spin supercurrent is proportional to the gradient of a phase. And this two coupled equation in motion can be combined into one, uh, one into this wave equation. Here C is a, a speed of sound, speed of sound wave. So, uh, and this dispersion is linear. And this linear dispersion is important because uh, there's a lambda criterion for stable supercurrent. So this what, what this means is that this, as long as uh, velocity of this uh, constituent mass, con constituent particle, is slower than this uh, velocity of this elementary excitations, then uh, this uh, supercurrent super is stable. But once this velocity goes higher, goes above than this critical, uh, this uh, speed, speed of sound wave, then supercurrent is no longer stable. So there is this, uh, so this uh, kind of a speed of light uh, sets the uh, limitation of the stability of this superfluid. And then let's, uh, let's go, go back and then summarize what are essential ingredients of this superfluidity. So we started, we started with this Hamiltonian, simple Hamiltonian, and there are two variables, number density and phase. And phase is spontaneously broken, and we have this uh, commutation relation between density and the phase. And then this Hamiltonian is uh, uh, invariant on the, this U1, uh, Hamil U1 uh, transformation. Because of this U1 symmetry, particle number is conserved, and then because of this commutation relation, excitations have linear dispersion, so we have this kind of speed of light. And as long as this velocity of mass, velocity of this particle is slower than this speed of light, superfluid is supported. So this is kind of uh, outline of this mass concept of mass superfluidity. And then let me go to this easy plane magnets. So this is the, uh, uh, by neglecting this dipolar interaction or spin orbit coupling, like relativistic interactions, uh, this, Hamilton, uh, this Hamiltonian describes, uh, let's say, low energy dynamics of easy plane magnets. The first term uh, is easy plane anisotropy with positive k. So G component of spin, so here N is direction of magnetiza magnetization or direction of spin density. The first term uh, basically suppresses this G component of spin density. The second term, uh, suppresses this uh, special variation of this uh, magnetization. And if you think of uh, this ground state, because NG is positive, the any, uh, any uniform state, spin states in the XY plane are ground states. So uh, this direction can be arbitrary in the XY plane. So the ground states are continuously degenerate with uh, this U1 manifold. 
So uh, from, from that ground state, uh, just low energy excitations can be described by this Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian can be approximated with this Hamiltonian. So this first term is the same, and the second term uh, is written in terms of this in-plane angle phi. So this special variation of this direction is now uh, captured by special variation of this uh, in-plane phase. And n g is a non-equilibrium spin density, uh, polarized in this direc g direction, and phi is in-plane angle. And then uh, from quantum mechanics, uh, we, uh, we learned that this angular momentum is generator of these uh, rotations, right? So uh, formally, it can be written, like, written as this commutative relation. The first S and G is a spin density, polarized the G direction, and phi is uh, this uh, in-plane angle. So they satisfy this uh, commutative relation. And this Hamiltonian is, uh, has a Yuan symmetry. So when phi is shifted globally, Globally, uh, energy does not change. According uh, this, uh, the conjugate of the quantity associated with this symmetry is spin density, polarized along g direction. So this we have Hamiltonian and we have this commutation relation. Then we can derive Hamilton equation of motion. This first equation is uh, again kind of spin analog of Josephson junction. This phi dot is equal to uh, it's proportional to the spin density along the g direction. So it's, it's basically, uh, this nz component basically uh, represents internal magnetic field in the g direction. And this phi da, the spin precesses around that internal magnetic field. So that's, that's this. And the second equation is nz dot is, uh, is proportional to Laplacian of phi, which can be written as this continuity equation. So js uh, here is uh, proportional to the gradient of this phi in plane angle. So you know, uh, you can see where I'm going. So, so I am making this analogy, analog analogy between mass super fluidity and spin super fluidity. The structure goes exactly the same. And by coupling these two coupled, uh, by, by uh, combining, into combining these two coupled equations into this one wave equation, this here, you see S is the uh, speed of a spin wave. It's linearly dispersed. And the lambda criteria for sp uh, stable spin, spin super current is that this uh, velocity, sh uh, velocity of this spin super current should be less than this speed of light, uh, it's the speed of this uh, spin wave. So you can make this comparison table between mass super fluid and spin super fluid. So we have this uh, similarly looking Hamiltonian. And in mass super fluid, we have this commutative relation between mass density and this uh, phase of wave function. And here we have commutative relation between spin component G along G direction and in-plane angle of phi. And this elementary excitations have a similarly linear dispersion. Uh, so and then uh, let me go to the easy axis magnet case, which uh, I I recently have worked on. So in EGX case, uh, this K is negative. So the ground state, there are two ground states, uniformly polarized states along the, in the positive G direction or in the negative G direction. So ground, there are two ground states, it's not continuously degenerate. So this ground state is uh, discrete and excitations are gapped because of this anisotropy there's a finite energy associated with this uh, tilting. So excitations are gapped. And this uh, ground states, if you look at this ground state, it's invariant on the, this uh, rotation about the g-axis, right? Because it's pointing north pole. If you, if you, even if you rotate it, it, it looks the same. So Yuan symmetry is not spontaneously broken. So there's no spin super fluidity. So, so Maybe, yeah, it, it, it looks like a boring system. We don't have a spin super fluidity, but we have uh, another interesting topological object, domain. So, we, uh, so, it's a, it, so as, uh, whenever we have uh, this discrete ground state, there's always a domain when, when this order parameter is continuous. Uh, when the, yeah. So this, as long as we have discrete ground state, there's always a domain 
here uh, we can connect this up, up domain uh, with the down domain by this smooth uh, variation of uh, this uh, magnetization. But you see uh, there are uh, multiple ways to connect this up domain to with uh, this down domain. So we, we can connect like this, we can connect like that, we can connect like this. So at the domain center, the spin at the domain center, spin should lie in the xy plane, right? Because it connects up spin to the down spin, somehow it should uh, go through this e equator of this block sphere, and it can point anywhere, any direction in the xy plane, right? So, which means that this uh, domain is uh, continuously degenerate, degenerate with the u topology. So there's a this is domain breaks this u one symmetry, symmetry spontaneously. And also excitation jagabless because Yuan symmetry is broken, there are th there's this number gold to mode. Yeah, from this fact, uh, we can, we can uh, guess, we can suspect there's a poss possibly there's a spin super fluidity inside the domain. So in this pa uh, paper, uh, we have looked into that uh, possibility. Uh, theoretically, not experimentally. So, uh, <coughs> so this is the uh, we have this. This is the uh, figure that I will use through the through my talk. So we have this up domain in the top. We have a down domain in the bottom. So we and we have this kind of straight line domain uh, between these two. So uh, how do you, how can you represent this domain on a state? So uh, we can use uh, it can be described by these two variables. First, this y. Why <coughs> is the uh, vertical position of this domain? So domain can be here or here, here, and this vertical position is rep represented by y. And this angle at that domain center, this implant angle, uh, should be also included. So this phi, big phi, capital pi, phi represents that ang implant angle at the domain center. And then uh, you can show that uh, Hamiltonian, the like easy plane. This easy plane, uh, Hamiltonian for easy plane magnets uh, can, be, uh, can be reduced into this Hamiltonian for, let's say, for domainal dynamics. So this, uh, so this, so this first term uh, represents a pinning potential for this domainer. So domainer is kind of trapped along this line, along this line of y equal to zero. So there's a trapping potential for domainer. And this second term represents uh, energy cost associated with this uh, angle variation, special variation. And then, uh, and then what, are, what are relations between this y and the phi? So if you, if you consider this y, let's say, let's say we have this domain, and let's say we, we push this domain to the, to the top, like we ho as a whole, like push this domain like, like this here. And then you, you see this, uh, negative, uh, this uh, negative domain is increased, is expand, ex expanded due to displacement of domain, right? So if domain is here, we have more, more like a, a negative magnetization. If domain is below this, and we have more uh, upspins. That means this uh, Y is why it captures this uh, G component of this uh, total spin of the system. And then uh, so in, this, in, the, uh, so in this original Hamiltonian, we had this, we had this density phase conjugated relation. And using this Y and phi uh, within some theoret theoretical framework, this can be uh, reduced, this can be uh, uh, written as this computation relation, this phi y and phi are canonically conjugate variables now. So they, they have this kind of computation <coughs> relation. And then again, we can derive this Hamiltonian cancel motion with this Hamiltonian computation relation. And it looks, uh, so it has the same structure as this, as with this mass superfluidity and this superfluidity, yeah? yeah. So can you please remind me, um, since I'm a bit confused about the direction of the arrows. Oh yeah. So, uh, are they in, so this is a 3D problem for my brain. 2D, 2D problem, yeah. It's 2D problem, so this, 2D, it's, this is 2D thin film of, uh, let's say, ferromagnet. 
This is 2D. They tap me. Oh, it must be a 3D problem because your spins and the top you kind of point out of the board. Uh -huh. the spins uh -huh. in the bottom point yeah, yeah, yeah. into the board. Uh -huh. And the spins in the plane are either doing something like this or like... Uh -huh. And there I'm confused. I see. I see. So, uh, can you please... <laughs> so, yeah, so this is, yeah, I have this <laughs> thin, thin ferromagnet. Uh -huh. And this is top view. So I am looking at looking from the okay. top. And magnetization is put, uh, uh -huh. like out of the paper and into the paper here. Okay. And spin rotates like this. In the spin rotates in the plane in this paper, like this. So out of the paper, into the paper, and like in uh, spins in in plane along the domain. So why do you well, why does it? Yeah, please. Why do you call it the axis magnet? I mean. Oh, because because a ground in the ground stage, it's always let's say in the ground stage, spins are all uh, out of the out of this paper like like this or like this. Mm -hmm. So so this it's PMA it's PMA magnet. And then we have this domain. So let's say we have up domain here, down domain here. Mm -hmm. There must be domain between them, and spins should lie in the lie in the xy plane uh, lie in this paper right to connect this to this from not to not go not from here to here right? huh? you can be this is you just cast a block right yeah 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 but still can be near right that's true that's true yeah yeah but yeah. this it depends on this angle phi so this when there are both i think present in this picture right both yeah yeah the both present yeah yeah for example let's say uh, So uh, this set is this domain. If you go along this line, it's a block wall. If you go it's along this line, it's narrow wall. Um. And this that distinction between block wall and narrow wall is kind of a meaningless if you don't have any stropy, implant any stropy. If you don't have a spinobic coupling, if you don't have any stropy, if you if this system is invariant under this spin rotation, then this distinction between block wall and narrow wall. Uh, not not the clear not the clear. There's a midi intermediate one. Yeah, I think the, 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 uh, yeah, actually, I have a question for Maria. I think Tion and Ruben have some work to s explicitly discuss how to tune a neo wall into block wall in sim auto right? Yeah, so we have a DMI. I think we get the neo wall. Yeah, so basically, I, I remember the result is that uh, basically for some system you can selectively tune the going into new and the block something, right? Yeah, yeah, can yeah. But can you have both at the same time? But, but playing with some parameters, I mean. This is more or less having both a block and a nail wall. Yeah, it's the same time. Same time. Continuously changing right. from block, nail, block, well, block, nail, block. Is that possible? Has anyone ever realized something like uh, that? Yeah, this is actually my question. <laughs> 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 because normally you have something which stabilizes mm -hmm. either a block because of, this, no, because of this anisotropy, in plane anisotropy. The point is it's not possible because you will always have anisotropy. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will have DMI and everything. As soon as there's an interface, you will have DMI and all kinds of crap. Yeah, so I'm for neglecting all kinds of anisotropy in the pl in plane anisotropy. Yeah, no. Isn't it not just that I'm not sure the people who said they are different in one, what, one has like magnetic charge and the other one doesn't have? So the dark mode of the Yeah, that, that comes from dipolar interaction. So I also neglect dipolar interaction here. Yeah. All kind of those kind of uh, bad things. <laughs> 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 so, but as this Cecilia uh, gave a talk about it, even if you have this easy plane, uh, some, some kind of in plane anisotropy, some kind of dipolar interaction, as long as you overcome this uh, barrier, there will be this kind of spiraling structure. Maybe it's not uniform, but there will be some kind of this uh, manifestation of this. Uh, kind of this this uh, spin transport. May, may I ask? Yeah. Sure. So, if you have possible, so if this kind of is doing basically something like this and probably like this, just so, so, so the domain wall thickness depends on the nature of the actual domain wall. So, do you have that kind of big variations in this domain wall and is not that kind of corresponding to some dissipation channel? Ah, uh, this thick. Thick of the thickness of this width of the domain. Yeah. That corresponds to. Uh, 
Because you have to work against some other subtlety at some point. No, we have this easy plane entropy. So we have this easy plane entropy. So the, the domain of width is given by a uh, square root of a over k. Yeah. So this, from this co two coefficients, you can get this character, characteristic length scale, right? Mm -hmm. That's domain of width. This domain of width, this width, vertical width. This, this width. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if this thing propagates, then, then you have to modify locally your Yeah, level. that's true. Actually, that's, second, that's kind of second order. That's oh, okay. This modulation is uh, proportional to spin current squared. So it's, there, is, there is some modulation, but not, not, not that important. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have this very similar structure. As long as we don't consider spin entropy, Gilbert damping, this kind of thing. So, and then we did this micromagnet simulations. So we inject a spin current on the left, only on the left, and then we, s we see how it uh, is transported by this domain. So we, we see this kind of uh, spiraling texture, spin texture. Because phi changes with uh, this along the x, and also all this the spin precedes with the uh, uniform frequency omega. What's the domain wall width there? Because it seems to go from a kind of outer plane to in plane, uh -huh. very also sharply, right? Along the domain here, at this domain width. Uh, so either the, the red or the blue is outer plane. Yeah, some kind uh, of, some into the plane, and then the domain wall is in plane. Yeah, it's just so a visualization. It's, uh, I think it's like 20 nanometer or something. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because of its visualization, it, there are a lot of spins between these two. This is not a single spin. Mm. This is kind of average sure, spin. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's not sharp if you look at look into this uh, real uh, real image. And then how uh, this uh, that's what uh, so and Yaroslav proposed. You, uh, you can, we can probe this uh, uh, spin superfluid by measuring spin pumping associated with this uniform spin precession. So the spin pumping, so by putting this platinum here, like this, this uh, spin precession will pump spin, right? And then that can be, uh, that can be probed by, this, by measuring this uh, voltage development across the metal. So uh, with some material parameters, with some real material parameters, we did this current density here, this uh, voltage development will be order of this microvolt, and there's this uh, dependence on L. L is the sample size, L is this length along this direction. So this signal will decay algebraically as a function of distance, as a function of distance between these two, uh, between the spin source and this spin, uh, uh, spin sink. And then we can do the same thing with the, this domain of spin superfluid. And then uh, we can make uh, this uh, kind of uh, ni nice but naive analogy of this etch model with uh, this uh, topological insulators. So in this uh, domain, in this uniformly polarized spin state, uh, Magnon has uh, this fixed chirality. Let's say Magnon rotates like this. And this, uh, in the negatively polarized domain, Domain uh, magnons uh, process like this. So this and this chirality is a good quantum number if the ground states do not break this UN symmetry. So we can interpret this chirality as this, uh, let's say, topological invariant. And this spin superfluid uh, at the domain can be interpreted as this edge mode between two uh, topologically distinct phase. This analogy is not uh, rigorous, but it's it's kind of a, a good to think in terms of this topological insulators. So why, why is it useful? Why, oh, so it, in, it can be interesting to someone. And then why is it useful? <laughs> so a uh, domainer can act as a uh, spin superfluid track. So this is an aerial view of mines penetrated by this Rhine River. And according to this Brit Britannica encyclopedia, Rhine River is the, uh, one of the most important arteries of uh, industrial transport in the world. And we can, because it is in Spintronics, domainer is uh, arguably the most studied 
object, uh, like a magnetic object, or magnetic soliton in spintronics. So it, there, there are a lot of ways to manipulate this domain. You, you can use the heat flux, you can use a spin wave, you can use a spin transport talk, spin hole talk. So a domainer can uh, serve as a, a versatile track for spin fluids. So it can be, it can be curved like this. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a uh, practical uh, view of uh, of this work. Let me <laughs> okay, and then let me go to this phase slip uh, phase slip stories. Uh, so what are phase slips? Now uh, let me focus into this uh, one-dimensional system. So because domainer is one-dimensional system, let me focus on this one-dimensional uh, sp uh, superfluid, and then let's make this periodic boundary condition. Uh, let's, this is uh, let's say superconducting wire, and like a superconducting ring, and there is those, this order parameter of psi, n is again density of a uh, superconductor, superconduct, superconducting component, and phi is a, a phase, and there are metastable states which are characterized by this phase winding number. So winding number, this winding number is, it means this, how many times the phase rotate, right? So this n, n can be zero, zero is uh, the ground state, n can be one, two, three, uh, those are metastable states. And phase slips <coughs> is the process through which uh, this uh, spin spark current is uh, dissipated. So, and then during the phase slips, a winding number changes. So for example, this figure is depicting, uh, this is free energy, and this is the winding number. So we have this n plus one state, we have n state. So n plus one state has a higher energy. And by thermal fluctuations, by thermal fluctuation, uh, it, the superconducting wire can go from this state to, to, to this state and release some energy. Also, by quantum fluctuations, it can go from here to here by decreasing, decreasing this phase uh, winding number. And then uh, I have worked on this phase slips of spin per fluidity in uh, one-dimensional ferromagnetic wi wire and one-dimensional quantum spin chain. With, uh, this work has been done in collaboration mm. with the So, And in this quantum phase slips, uh, there is an interesting story because this phase slip distinguish half integer spin chain and this integer spin chain. There is this quantum effect associated with this, uh, this topological, uh, topological term in the Lagrangian. So this di distinction is kind of similar to this uh, finite Haldane gap for integer spin chain and this Gabriel's XY spin chain. So there's an interesting story. So if you are interested, in, then please look into this paper. And then let me go to the, let me explain this phase slips in spin superfluid in a domain one. So uh, let's say uh, we have this periodic boundary condition between left and right. Here, this uh, in-plane angle uh, rotates in the xy plane once, right? So this from, if from here, if phi, rota phi rotates like this. Phi rotates the equator once, yeah? Is that a reasonable assumption to say that it does rotate exactly once? No, I mean, no, no. It could have any texture. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah. And it's going to have any. Yeah, it's not reasonable yeah. assumption for this. Yeah. But uh, so this, if you look at this paper by Halperin and Bekumbo about this thermally activated phase slips, mm -hmm. they always consider this kind of periodic boundary condition, and they calculate, uh, let's say, resistance of this uh, superconducting wire. But that resistance uh, should not depend on this finite sample size because it's bulk, bulk effect. So theoretically, they they use this kind of periodic boundary condition, and this bulk property should not depend on it. Okay. So. Yeah, it's kind of a reasonable starting point. Yeah, so this phi uh, rotates in plane, uh, uh, rotates this circle once. So it's a U1 winding, U1 winding number is one with this texture. Let's go back to this uh, to the film. And let's consider how spins change from the top to the bottom. Oops. So here we have this up spin. So we start from here, North Pole, and as we go below, this spin rotates the equator once, and here we arrive at the South Pole. South Pole, so meaning that this spin spin texture, this 2D spin texture, wraps the uh, wraps the unisphere once, right? So this whole this spin texture wraps the unisphere once. 
which means the uh, Skomian charge of this texture is one. The Skomian charge of this guy is one. And this U1 winding number of this guy along the domain is one. So you can, actually you can show that uh, in metastable stage with the periodic boundary conditions, this winding, U1 winding number is always the same as this Skomian charge of this whole texture. Get it? No, you don't get it. Uh, <coughs> so let's let's just look at this uh, spin along the domain. Then it changes. It it goes from here, here to like this, right? So it circle. It it rotates circle once, right? This like this, like this. And if you if we collect all the spins in the XY in the, this two D film. Spins go from, start from North Pole, and then it, it wraps this uh, equator once, and then it goes to the South Pole. So as a whole, it wraps this unisphere once. That's how, that's why Skomian charge of this Skomian is one. The spin wraps the unisphere once. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, so let's say uh, we have this uh, identity for metastable stage. So what it means, what it means is this. So we start, we start from this configuration with winding number one and scumian charge one. And there will be, at finite temperature, there will be phase slips which unwind this winding number. We, that's what we know from charge superconductivity and this mass superfluidity, there will be phase slips. And then, so this winding number will decrease from one to zero by these phase slips. And then during, during that, uh, because this Skomian charge is conserved, conserved, it's conserved quantity. So you can, show, you can show it from this, uh, by using the property that this direction is unifactor. But so this, so here we have a winding number one, Skomian charge one. Here we have a winding number zero. So the Skomian charge of this domain is zero, but, somehow, but there must be some one Skomian charge because the Skomian charge is a conserved quantity. But the Skomian should decay. Really that's right, yeah, yeah. The Skomian should decay. Yeah, that's right. And then, yeah, okay, Skomian, okay, and then, so this phase slip will push its Skomian to the boundary. And they will decay, right? They will decay. Right, that's true. Yeah, that's fine, but because we have this finite uh, length, there will be some scomians uh, arriving this boundary. Then we can detect this scomian. So that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's how these phase slips uh, connect to this, to this scomian generations. Okay. And then this scomian creation uh, can be uh, experimentally probed by putting metal here again. Metal, any metal, metal, and then connect, uh, uh, co uh, this measure this voltage here, here. And as this chromium goes through this metal, because of this electromotive force, there will be voltage development across this metal. So this Vm uh, will be proportional to the uh, scomian uh, creation rate. So th that's how we can uh, that's how you can observe this coming generation. So with this some cu uh, current, uh, this voltage uh, is approximately seven nanovolt, which is small, but experimentally reachable at this uh, temperature. Yeah. <laughs> so why is it important? Well, why are I talking about this, this coming generation by phase slips? That's because this Skomian generation is kind of uh, uh, one, one important uh, topic to make, it, make this Skomionics uh, practical. So to use Skomian as this memory unit or Skomian racetrack memory, we need to, uh, you need to able to nucleate single Skomian. So there are several proposals how to create Skomians and this domain of phase slips can be one way to uh, create these communes. All right, and then this, this is almost last. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
And then, yeah, so this, <coughs> so if we have a, when we, uh, uh, when you have this scomian, scomian or scomian crystal, uh, uh, this magnon, magnon on top of this scomian texture, uh, so this magnon is a field, uh, this emergent magnetic field due to this scomian texture. So this single scomian corresponds to, let's say, one magnet, one, uh, immer uh, one quantum flux for this emergent magnetic field. So this is the uh, pictorial uh, uh, explanation of this magnon hole effect. So we have a scomian, applied temperature gradient, and magnon does not go straight uh, because of this uh, scomian, and scomian creates this effective magnetic field for magnons. So there will be this kind of hole effect. So that's magnon hole effect. So this, that can be described by this uh, effective Lorentz force of magnons. Here v F is force, V is velocity of magnon, B is the effective magnetic field due to, <laughs> due to this uh, scomian texture. And it's written like this. <coughs> and if you look at expression for scomian charge, this is basically integrant of this uh, scomian charge. So effective magnetic field is proportional to, let's say, scomian density. <coughs> and then uh, we can consider this magnon uh, passing through this domain. And the, because this domain carries uh, scomian charge, finite scomian charge, uh, localized along the domain, this magnon will fill emergent magnetic field. So there'll be, again, magnon hole effect. Not because of scomians, because of this uh, superfluid-induced uh, emergent magnetic field. And then, uh, importantly, this uh, magnitude of emergent magnetic field can be controlled by spin super current. So if there's no spin super current, emergent magnetic field is zero. If you put a lot of spin current into this domain, this emergent magnetic field will increase proportionally to, proportionally to this uh, injected spin current. Why, I, why, do we, uh, why are you interested in that? Uh, one interesting direction from here is that uh, if we consider this, if we have this array of domainers carrying finite supercurrent, that will create uh, this uh, magnonic crystal for magnons with this emergent magnetic field. So there will be localized, uh, there will be this uh, array of uh, uh, artificial array, uh, artificial lattice of this emergent magnetic field on magnons. So that, that you can like, create some interesting phenomena for magnons. Okay. Uh, so let me summarize my talk. So we have studied uh, some interesting phenomena out of the Hamiltonian. The, si uh, the message is simple easy axis magnet, which can be considered boring. It's not boring because it, it, it should, it, there's an orchestra of this topological object, domainal, spin super fluid, scamion, and this controllable emergent electromagnetic field of magnets. So uh, it's not boring system. And the spin super fluid, the concept of spin super fluid uh, provides, uh, uh, provides, an, a pl provides a platform to discuss all these kind of things, right? Spin super fluid, phase slips, edge scomians. This. So it's a very useful concept. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for your attention.